by email? Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. I will I will send you um, everything. In principle, I will I will put this in uh, my web page so at the at the graph. Okay. Oh, okay. So what's happening? Sorry, as well. Ah, right, right, right. <laughs> of course, you can you can see it. Please, let's have a look. So, but I, I, my my aim is to give these lectures in a not rushing a lot. Uh, I will see if. Um, if uh, we are uh, lacking time towards the end, uh, I will possibly write the lectures at home and we scroll here. But uh, but for now, I will start. I will write the lectures mostly, okay. so that you can follow it, uh, so that you have time to process the information. That was my uh, my idea. Uh, as well, if I can go down, just let me know. You still. <laughs> Please. Uh, I, 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 I have no <laughs> I will. I will post the online. It um, possibly even today. I will let you know. I just need to know if there is uh, enough space. I think our web page. Uh, I think it's fine to post it. There. Right. So. Okay, this is the QR code to, to the web page where you can find the, the, the lectures that I will be mostly following. And I think now we, we can start uh, with, uh, with the proper contents, let's say. So, uh, the first thing is uh, like a step number zero, which is just uh, recalling you, so what are the elementary particles and the fundamental interactions, the ones that we know of. So, the ones that uh, you are mostly familiar with, I guess, are the, the fermions. I think all of you have heard about what are quarks and what are leptons. And the quarks, you have like two, um, two types, up-type quarks and down-type quarks, which is difference besides the mass, of course, the mass of the up-type quarks and the mass of the down-type quarks is different even between uh, themselves of course so the, the quarks they all have different masses uh, but uh, another thing that distinguishes them and groups them is uh, the uh, electric charge and this electric charge it has to do with uh, with their uh, um, with the, with their structure in terms of uh, electric interactions their hypercharge and their isospin uh, and the quarks, they uh, basically feel all interactions. They, they, they interact by the electromagnetic force, by the weak force, strong force, gravitationally as well, because they, they, they have mass, but not only because of that. And we see the case of the photon. And also uh, they interact with the Higgs, uh, which is uh, what uh, gives them a mass. Yes. Why is it the Higgs boson considered a fundamental force, like the, the other part? That's an amazing question. So the question here, if uh, by the way, online, do you, can you hear the questions here? Um, not not very well. Okay. A little bit. I will I will uh, re I will repeat them. So so what was asked here was that the why uh, is the Higgs not considered a fundamental force uh, as the other as the other interactions? I mean, the Higgs is not a force line. The Higgs is a, is a, is a particle. It could be in the limit of force carrier. Yes. And it does indeed mediate uh, the interaction that, uh, that uh, gives mass to the, to the particles. But the Higgs is not, um, is not part of the, the gauge structure, the, 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 the transformation properties of the internal symmetries of the theory. And that, the, the force is like electromagnetic, weak, strong, Gravity is even aside from this, but let's let's concentrate only on these three ones. Uh, they emerge from uh, the gauge principle. We gauge a theory, or in other words, we localize a symmetry, and um, because of the invariance that we need to force, we need to say that the theory has to be invariant 
everywhere. So uh, that gives rise to the, the gauge bosons. They emerge naturally from that. Uh, and the Higgs is, is a little bit different. So the Higgs is a, is a, is a scalar or results from a, a, a scalar that interacts via the weak and the electromagnetic forces or the electroweak force. Uh, and uh, results, and we put it them by hand. We, we introduce the Higgs, we can introduce one Higgs, two, 10, it doesn't matter. But the, the, the forces itself, we define the transformation properties. We say they have to be, um, we need this invariance and only one photon emerges. One W, I mean, W plus W minus, so do two Ws opposite, uh, with opposite charge emerge. Eight gluons emerge, no more, no less, uh, and, um, and the Z boson. So this is this uh, this is a little bit different than what happens with the Higgs, but it's not wrong to say that the Higgs is mediated in interaction. That's something perfectly correct. In fact, uh, when we we say that something is mediated in, in interaction, when we have something like uh, like this happening, so there is some uh, some mediator here, mediator, some mediator uh, there which it, this can be a gauge boson, but you can also write something like this, where you can have a Higgs boson here. So these sort of things can happen. And uh, one of the things that uh, this course is meant to is, is for you at the end to understand properly what's going on uh, here. So that was a very good question. And I, uh, I want all of you to ask questions whenever you feel like. So about the leptons, uh, there is a few interesting things here, which is, um, of course, the neutrinos are neutral, as the name indicates, so they don't interact by the electromagnetic force, neither the strong force, as well as their charged partners, which don't interact by the strong force. Um, however, neutrinos, they do interact via uh, the gravitational uh, force. In fact, they, they, they have mass. Uh, and they interact with the Higgs. And I'm putting this square with the red uh, tick because um, in the standard model, the, the neutrinos, for the neutrinos, we would have to have a cross here in this place. Not, not here. Here it's, uh, it's for a different reason. But here, we would have to have a cross in the standard model. But this is one of the big, big failures of the standard model, which is a correct theory. <laughs> it's a, it's a correct theory. It works amazingly well, but fa badly fails for neutrinos. Well, maybe I'm being too 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 strong in ba saying badly failing because neutrino neutrinos have uh, very 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 small masses. So maybe the failure is measured by the the size of the neutrino mass. So I will I will say again, it's a failure, but perhaps not a bad failure. But one of the confirmed things where, uh, where the standard model uh, does not explain uh, what we see in nature, that neutrinos have mass. They oscillate between different flavors. So a neutrino tau oscillates into muon neutrinos and electron neutrinos. And this oscillation is a quantum superposition of mass eigenstates. This here, this here are flavor eigenstates here. Uh, we can regard this as flavor eigenstates, not mass. And neutrinos can mix via mass eigenstates and oscillate between different flavors. Uh, also, uh, yeah, and this is, this is uh, what I wanted to say about these uh, fermions. And uh, yeah, of course, we also have this first, second and third generation replication. This is one of the things that we know that exists, but we don't really understand why. Also, we don't understand why the masses are so different here. We know how the masses are generated. This is what I'm going to teach you. But what I'm not going to teach you, and nobody can teach you exactly, is uh, how uh, and why the mass of the particles and why three generations. This is uh, a big question. I have my ideas, I have my proposals, but others have their ideas and their own proposals. Um, and this is something that we can discuss in the second course, of course. Um, for the case of the, the, the gauge bosons, this is uh, there is something interesting here. So we have the photon, 
which is the force carrier of the electromagnetic force, but it doesn't does not interact via any electromagnetic interaction. So it's it's a neutral factor. So it does not feel the electromagnetic force, but he's carrying it. Um, in fact, it only feels gravity. Like you know, those that are uh, working in gravity, you know that uh, uh, that uh, light follows the ge geodesic in space-time. So if the space-time is curved, so light follows the curve. Uh, and this is why they interact with gravity in the same as Gluon's one. Of course, there are no, I tell you, there are no proofs or there, there is no measurement because gluons, they, they exist confined uh, inside, uh, uh, inside quarks, let's say, um, or inside hadrons. But uh, they, they, um, they behave as, as, uh, as photons in this regard. Uh, also, the Z boson, I want to say that the Z boson is like a, a massive partner of the photon. In fact, the photon and the Z boson, they have the same quantum numbers. The only thing that distinguishes between them uh, is uh, the mass. The photon doesn't have a mass, the Z boson does have a mass. And there is a mixing between these two in the standard model, uh, which is, um, which is, uh, um, which, which is uh, measured or, or quantified by an angle, the Weinberg angle, uh, if you heard about it already, uh, which is um, the, the measure the size of how the photon and the Z boson mix. mix. So you will, you will see all of this throughout these two courses. We also have a scalar, a fundamental scale. This is the only fundamental scalar in nature, spin zero. Yes, as well. Yeah. If so, something interacts with it, right? So the photon does not interact with other photons. Right. So you cannot write these sort of things that I'm going to write here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You see? Photon, 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 photon. <laughs> this is this, yeah, this is badly wrong. <laughs> this uh, cannot happen. Yeah. This is wrong, basically wrong so this is something that uh, doesn't happen uh, uh, so of course at quantum level you can you can have things like yes right but the electron is not a force carrier right so when you say it doesn't interact with the photons it means it doesn't interact with the force carrier exactly exactly this is this is let's define our our um, th that's that's what I'm saying. When I say interaction, is there is like some vertex here. You, we have a, an interaction vertex here, and um, there is no interaction vertex with uh, with uh, two or more photons or three three or more photons. So, uh, and, and typically it's in in a, in a vert triple vertex is like this. We will define the interactions in this way. All right, but for the W bosons and the gluons. They interact with the, with the yes. Okay. So they uh, gluons and double bosons they interact am among themselves. Yes, um, and that's why gluons uh, feel the strong force, and there's a tick here, and that's why Ws feel both the electromagnetic and the weak force. But Z doesn't, as as well as the photon, does not interact with the uh, with himself. Okay. Any particular reason? Yes, there is a particular fundamental reason for that, which is connected to your uh, your first question. It's because of the gauge symmetry, the structure. Right. When you have this is going to be for the second course again, okay. but the, the when you have uh, an abelian theory, so where where the, the, the generators of the symmetry commute, all they all commute, which is the case of a U1 symmetry, is the is the case of the electromagnetic theory. It's an abelian theory. Um, the non commutation of the generators uh, forbids the existence of vertices of, uh, of um, gauge bosons. When you have a non abelian theory, you have a term, uh, the, the commutation of, for example, you all know this uh, the, the polymatrices and the commutation relations of uh, polymatrices. Um, yes. so that is something that will show up at the level of the uh, electroweak interactions. 
because the 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 the, the, the weak part let's say of the electric interactions is an SU2 symmetry and SU2 uh, generated by uh, the poly matrices are the generators of the SU2 symmetry and then because of the, the this commutation relation uh, with an X on uh, IJK and uh, T, TK, let's say, we, you will have um, terms in the Lagrangian involving three and four, uh, three and four uh, weak bosons. You will see that uh, explicitly showing up. And, and uh, if, yeah, if thinking about the ground, the particles, uh, is, is that only the so let, uh, uh, I didn't hear everything, and I want to repeat it to the. So can so about the graphic. If we had the graviton, and yes. Uh, why would it be the only ah. on the graviton? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. If you had the graviton, yeah, exactly. In in principle, it would be exactly only on on the gravity because it would. Um, if it tips mass, that's exactly. It would be only in the in the. So uh, the question here was uh, was uh, very uh, interesting. So if we also had a graviton here, let's let's suppose that we discover a theory of uh, quantum gravity, and then we have a graviton, and let's say the graviton is massless. In fact, we think it should be massless if it exists. Also, we look at the gravitational waves; they propagate at the speed of light. So the graviton must be, if it exists, uh, it must be massless. So it uh, would not interact with the Higgs, uh, and it's also neutral. So it does not interact with the electromagnetic force. It would not interact with the weak or strong force. It would only interact gravitationally because it would just follow the geodesic. Oh, well, for example, in linearized gravity, the the, the gravitational perturbation behaves like a tensor in in cosmic space. Mm -hmm. So. Can it be included in the standard model, or even in the linearized theory, we have problems quantizing that temperature? Uh, so the question here is if in, in a linear, a linearized version of uh, gravity, uh, if we quantize it, so we would always have problems in quantizing okay. it. Uh, it's uh, the, the problem of it when you start renormalizing the theory. That, that's the, where the problem shows up. Uh, you when you renormalize uh, uh, the theory of quantum gravity you start uh, not being able to remove the divergences and uh, it's a it's a big problem but that's i'm i'm really not expert on on that to provide deeper details but uh, i know it's a problem okay so this was uh, an introduction um now i will start with the with the lecture itself let's say with the, with the contents um and uh, with a with a revision about uh, special relativity and what is the reason to discuss this um ah by the way just one thing in half an hour we make a, a break because this is a three hour thing and we we make a break in half an hour and then we, we resume uh, 10 minutes later or something so uh, excuse me yes I'm 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 really sorry to interrupt. It's just um, I uh, wanted to ask a practical question. Yes. Uh, yes. I apologize. You were saying it later, but uh, you said that we can get these recordings uh, uh, as a link uh, sometimes because today I have a medical appointment. I have to uh, leave a little earlier. Mm -hmm. So yes. I, I was just wondering if uh, the recordings will be available to us as well. Yes. This is this is my idea. My idea is to to record and to put the lectures. All of them, all of it online and available for you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. This a lot. is this is the idea. The idea is for you to, to be here in the lecture and being able to follow the things without having the rush of writing everything, only a few notes, and then you can uh, see it again at home. Or uh, okay. uh, but yes, if you have to leave, of course, uh, you feel free, uh, and uh, I will upload. I hope this is recording. I guess I guess this is. I guess it is. Yes, it is. Okay. Thanks a lot. No worries, no worries. Okay, so the first thing that I will um, introduce here, which uh, some of you may know already very well, is the principle of relativity. So the principle of relativity. 
And uh, what it says essentially is that um, all laws in nature, all laws in nature are identical in all inertial uh, reference frames. So basically, all laws of nature are identical, identical in all reference frames. Uh, sorry, you know, inertial frames, exactly. Thank you. Inertial reference frames. <laughs> So, um, and uh, what, what does it mean? In fact, if we define a certain function of uh, uh, space-time coordinates, let's say t, x, y, z, we move to another reference frame, inertia frame, x prime, y prime, z prime, and this holds, so basically, Basically, this is uh, um, what, uh, what should happen. So the laws of nature are invariant under transformation of uh, coordinates. So basically, this, this yields that the laws of nature are invariant under coordinate of the transformations. And there is a word here that I will highlight, which is this, invariant. Because this is going to be the word that you will hear mostly, more times uh, throughout these uh, two, uh, two courses. And this has indeed outstanding consequences, the, uh, the invariance. Um, in the in principles are invariance in, uh, in physics, in fact. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that you might also remember very well is that uh, the potential energy interaction. Um, so in classical mechanics, for example, you, you have, so the interaction between uh, particles of a rigid body or something like that, it's given by a certain potential, a certain potential energy. And when you, when you, when, for example, if I, this table that, I, that I'm sitting on, or the tables that you are sitting on there at home, if you, if you pick one end and you, you move it, it looks like everything is going to move simultaneously and uh, instantly. So this has this, uh, this principle that, uh, or this idea that uh, this, this signal, this message passes instantly. And this was indeed uh, behind what uh, um, what, uh, what uh, uh, Newton has, uh, um, so the, 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 the classical mechanics uh, built by Newton and other uh, important names, um, uh, the interactions were instantaneous. But what happens in reality, and this was due to Einstein, is that this uh, uh, interaction is indeed not instantaneous. So, so the interactions, so interactions, in fact, so interactions actions, actions propagate at a finite finite velocity. Which is given by the speed of light. This is also very important in what follows, um, because also this is the same for all inertial frames. Same in all frames. And the classical limit, you know that the classical limit, classical, limit is when you take 
velocities that are much smaller than C, then you recover classical mechanics. Classical mechanics. Right, so let's just uh, put it a little bit more formal now. So the first thing, uh, let me draw here, try to draw here two uh, inertial frames. So first, let's see if I can draw it properly. So first let's draw here a frame. This is going to be the O frame. And I will draw here, I will change the color. I will draw here another frame. Yeah. O prime frame, which is moving at a constant velocity. with respect to um, to the frame O. So in fact, I will put here in the, in the origin, O prime here, like this, like this, and like this, in this way. Right, and now this is moving along the uh, X. So this is X, this is X prime. And now here we have Z. This is blue, so Z, Z prime, and here we are going to have Y. Uh, this is blue, Y, and here Y prime. Right. So frame O prime is moving relative uh, to uh, frame O. And now we can uh, define an event. So we can have an event P. T1 and another event here, T2. These are two events. Let's consider these two events. So, and if a, a, a signal is sent from P1 to P2, so P1, P1 is at a point T, X, Y, X1, T1, X1, one, the one, and we have P2, which is in the reference frame O. It's also at uh, T2, X2, Y2, Z2. So, and we send a signal from P1 to P2, which travels at the speed of light. So there's a signal. Um, which is received at point uh, P2. So let me put here an arrow just indicating that the signal is going in, in that direction. Um, and uh, what, what is the distance? So distance distance travel traveled by the signal. So this distance is, let's call it delta R, which is going to be C delta T, which is simply C T2 minus T1. So I will define something with this. It's, it's going to be very important now for those that are working in gravity. Uh, I will use a different signature of the metric. That's why I'm introducing this. That is going to be uh, <laughs> an important matter. So, uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, what is the distance? So this was the distance uh, traveled by the signal and what is the distance um, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the space time coordinates? Instant also sign as 
So we can also write the distance in the following way. In delta R, it's going to be square root of delta X squared plus delta Y squared plus delta Z squared. So, you know, delta X, Y, and Z is simply uh, X2 minus uh, X1 and so on. Right, so uh, we can then uh, define something like if we take this, let, let's call this uh, star, let me put, and here two stars, and from star and from these two, we know that the delta R, so this uh, delta R is equal to delta R, of course. So uh, what we have is that C, C squared, delta T squared is going to be equal to delta X squared plus delta Y squared plus delta Z squared. And now this is where the difference between uh, between gravity and uh, and the particle physics, the approaches are going to differ. And the way we reorganize this equation, basically. So this is the same as, and now I will put here in in particle physics. How do we solve this in particle physics? We solve this in the following way. We put the space-time coordinates on the, from the right to the left-hand side. So we say that we have C squared delta T squared minus delta X squared minus delta Y squared minus delta Z squared equal to zero, of course. And this is defined as the line element delta s squared which in this case we are talking about a, a light signal this is a no uh, a no trajectory um this this was re recall this was a signal so a light uh, this was a um, light from uh, p1 to P2. So it's a null trajectory. But what about the O frame? So th this was so far, this was in the uh, frame O. So this was in O. And what about now O prime? So in the O prime frame, we have something like we have delta S prime squared. This is going to be equal to C squared. So the, the, the speed of light is the same in any, any frame. So uh, delta T prime squared minus delta X prime squared minus delta Y prime squared minus delta Z prime squared and this is also equal to zero so in fact so here we have delta s squared equals to delta s prime squared this is one of the things that that we uh, uh, important results so here we conclude that from the principle so we conclude that from the principle of invariance of the speed of light of the speed of light if If delta S is zero, 
in one reference frame, reference system. It is zero in any other inertial frame. Okay, so this is a conclusion so, uh, of this, and this is equal to zero in this case. But, uh, ah, and of course, uh, now uh, we let's make it uh, more concrete in a way. Um, so we can define this uh, also in terms of uh, infinitesimal, uh, infinitesimal, um, uh, an infinitesimal line element. We can simply define as ds squared equals to c squared dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. And uh, we can collectively write this also as c squared dt squared minus dr squared. So this is a way how we can write it and we can further write this in the matrix form. So ds squared can be written as a c dt dx dy dz. And here it goes, and uh, minus one, minus one, minus one, zeros here, zeros there, and now c dt dx the i, the z. And here, this is um, from where we extract, of course, now defining our uh, four vectors. So I think all of you here are familiar with four vectors. I think this is not. So we can also write this as d s squared equals to g mu nu, g mu nu, d x mu d x nu where this is our uh, g mu nu, g mu nu. So this is the line element written in a, let's say in a tensor uh, notation. So, and we have this metric signature now. So metric signature. Is there a particular reason why you do in part of the F to use this metric <laughs> so the question here is if there is any reason if in particle physics we use this. Well, um, it's just a convention, but this is uh, uh, the way uh, the klein gordon equation is, is written, for example. Um, we, if it's with a plus or with a minus. Uh, when, uh, so it's, that's, that's uh, we will, when we go to the klein gordon equation, uh, you will see uh, the importance of this, but this is just a convention. The f physics will, will never change, and I think this. Yes, I was wondering why. Is the other <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes, that's. I know that's. Um, that's. Uh, um, that can be an issue, and there is the the books from Weinberg are written in the gravity convention. I'd say. Uh, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know when I learned, uh, for me, it, it made more sense the other one, but then I got so used to this one that uh, <laughs> I will uh, you be using this one here. Are we going to keep the seeds around? Or... No, no. So this is only up until uh, there will be a point, hopefully today, where I say, now let's forget uh, about all of it. But it, this is important because at least up to a certain point, it's interesting to, it's important to know what are the, uh, the units that we are working with, and just as an introductory, introductory part. Uh, because here there are some arguments that you see that uh, we need to consider the, uh, the, the, the units. And if you, if you get rid of C's and the H bars and so on, you can lose track of, uh, the, of, uh, of the meaning of the quantities. No. Because when, when you do measurements, you need to take all of this into account. Of course, when you do theory, you completely forget about this. So metric, metric signature in particle physics.
it's simply going to be this mu nu equals to by ag plus minus minus minus. So this is the metric signature that you are going to be using uh, throughout uh, this course. So, and then you can do a lot of fun things with this metric. So you can uh, raise indices. So you have a certain four vector, which is um, of mu x mu can, in this case, uh, we are lowering index. You can uh, uh, also show some properties, for example, this property, g mu nu, g mu alpha. So do you know what is this? The exactly. So we have this. Um, you also have, um, of course, here, here the, the, the if, if you apply this, if you apply the metric, and if you define x mu equal to still with c's, <laughs> ct x y z, then x x mu is going to be ct minus x minus y minus z. And another thing that I will not follow forever is the is the, the x y and z of course. <laughs> I will condense the, the notation uh, in, in a little bit. So, uh, but now what, what happens when we have, uh, um, when we are not talking about uh, uh, these uh, uh, null trajectories? So what if the, what, basically what if a particle has a mass? What if um, a particle, as mass and the trajectory is not null. So we can write between two reference frames that ds squared equals to a certain, let's call certain constant a ds prime squared. You can just assume that these two are proportional. Um, and uh, to see this, to see what is A, uh, actually we want to see that A is 1, because we know that's, uh, that's what it should be. Uh, let's consider three reference frames now, three inertial frames. So we'll consider a certain frame O, a frame O1. No, I, will, I will do it in a better way. So only, so we are considered reference O1 and O2. We consider these two uh, reference frame. And now let's look at the, at, um, at the velocities of this with respect. So uh, uh, let's also consider the, let me try to make it in, the, in a more concrete way. So we are going to define V1, V1, as velocity of O1 uh, in relation information that with respect to with respect to O. Now this is defined V2 as the velocity of O2 with respect to O. And they're going to define a V12 as velocity of O1 with respect to O2. So we have three reference frames, the O, the, 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 the one that uh, we started with, the O1 and then an O2. We are not defining any with any directional information about these velocities at the moment. So, uh, with this information, we can write uh, the following. We can write that ds squared is equal to a v1, because this a coefficient, this must be dependent on these velocities, right? So, I think this is intuitive, right? So, 
is a v1 d s1 squared we also should have v s um, squared also equal to a v2 d s2 squared and also d s1 squared equal to a v12 ds2 now we can simply equate these two so this and this and also uh, solve this and put we can take from here that basically a1 so a I am, I am exactly here. So we can we can say that a v12 is equal to a. So th this is I, I'm putting ds1 basically ds1 over uh, ds2, meaning that uh, a1 v2 is equal to a v1 over a v2. Right, but now what uh, what we have here? There is something here that uh, that uh, that is important. This velocity here, so this here, depends on the angle between uh, the vectors, the velocity vectors v one and v two. Between v1 and v2, these two vectors, basically. So, um, for example, if uh, if this is all collinear, let's say, if this is all aligned. This uh, th these uh, velocities would all be uh, the same, right? This would all be equal. And what is the only number that would satisfy? Uh, so what hey has to be equal to to satisfy this in all circumstances? Exactly. Oswaldo replied. So it's one. So the only only possibility. Let me call this uh, equation possibility, possibility to, uh, to fulfill um, in all cases is for a equals to one. So I repeat once again. If these are so, the, the, the most uh, intuitive way or easiest way to see this uh, is um, if uh, these velocities are all aligned uh, and if they are all the same, um, then the only possible this is clear that it has to be one. When you have an angle between them, it should not uh, you should not vary from this one. Otherwise, this this uh, this uh, this equation would not uh, hold any longer so it should be independent of that and should be a constant one and this is just a, a, an argument to say that uh, um, with this we have that always ds squared equals to ds prime squared and this is one of the fundamental results of special relativity in fact so is it clear so basically the interval between two events is the same in all frames, inertial frames. Uh, and the S is an invariant under coordinate transformations. So this is the most, uh, so what you take from here, and this is the point I was leading to that the S squared, the S squared, let me put a better S, the S squared is an invariant. And under coordinate transformations. Uh, 
Okay. Right. So uh, before moving to the Lorentz transformation itself, I think uh, we you may need a break because this is already uh, one hour and a half despite the, the, the initial issues. So let's take 10 minutes, 10 minutes and be here at, uh, well, 10, uh, 1044. Let's resume at 1044. For those there online, so are you, is, are you okay? Uh, can you hear what I'm saying? It's okay. Okay, good. So let's have a, a small break, a 10 minutes for us to, to have a rest and then we resume. Okay. As soon as possible. 
Uh, and then I will invite you to be here physically. Yes, because I, I, when I met Pedro, I, I thought about moving that, and he was so worried about the money, I mean, the price of the travel from mm -hmm. yeah, I will, I have some money for that okay. on, on my project, so. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be, I think, uh, nice for me to have been to the forest, maybe to the empty, if this year is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, we can still or, talk away. Yeah, the thing is, besides that the project is possible to do, mm -hmm. it's a little bit risky, mm -hmm. so not to think, in the sense that it's exploratory. We cannot immediately foresee uh, what's going to happen. But it's a very interesting subject and uh, yeah. there, there are only one paper then. No. Yes. Because from the Zoom call you did I understood that there were more. Mm, so no. maybe I was wrong No, there is another paper but it's not only much in Okay. The theory that we would like to apply it to. Okay. Which is a different thing. Okay. This is the concept. There are different concepts of the emerging drug, for example. Yeah, I wanted also to ask you, like, for a, I don't know, a review of emerging drugs in general, because I found some linkages, but they are so different. And, and if you have, like, a good one to suggest, so would you like without the other one? No, 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 sorry. <laughs> there is, in fact, a lot of different approaches to emerging drugs. Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, it's not one specific thing. It's, um, for example, not noises if it emerges from QCD, okay. from the confinement of the mm -hmm. quartz and blue, and it's how that emerges from there. Because, like, here in uh, the the, the method is assumed to be there, right? The, mm -hmm. the metric. Yes, because it's it, assumed to be. Yeah, because you start with the um, with, um, with quantum field theory, pretty much, so in class this time. And it, so, but you don't curve the space time as a fundamental thing, it emerges from the, from the, the fields, basically. Yes. And the, the, the 5,000 super consists to say that sometimes that the renormalization of the fields is what is somehow transferred to gravity. Okay. Uh, uh, but the, the point here is that that's the concept, uh -huh. and uh, it's shown there for a scalar and for a canyon. Yeah, and I, I, I try to understand the scalar part. Mm -hmm. But yes, and I wanted to explain something more about that. We need to talk about transition. Okay. Yes. Talk some more. So, but you, you got really interested about that, right? It, yeah, and because uh, when I did the corpuscular model for our team, uh, we did not, uh, we, we assumed the condensed of graphons mm -hmm. being there. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we assumed its existence and that it tried to work on it. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting for me to like try, try to start from some first principles and Which is try to draft. The main point is that we have a a model which um, is based on unification. Mm -hmm. So unification of all interactions, not gravity is fundamental, but unification of all interactions also matter, forces, peaks, mediates. So it's like, uh, what is assumed to be there is okay, the regard metric, and then the mass of peaks mm -hmm. are so and then you find the and, yes. the exactly. and then the cycle and the question is how to, uh, from there to how does the graphic emerge there. But one of the things that uh, I was thinking about is even before that, um, if it's possible to do this only with the standard model. So how can the graphic be emergent? Instead of model or some extension of it. So we have seen the master part to be on this other country. Mm -hmm. okay. right. So from this post-check, how how this is going to be evolved in a simple in a simple theory and what happens. And then stepwise we grow to the level of unification. Mm -hmm. um, because they in the paper they only we only consider the one mm -hmm. kind of piece of part, but then yes. Yeah. Exactly. So that is to put that in a realistic context. Mm -hmm. We can start with the simplest realistic context that we 
So we have said it would be somewhere in the in a, just in the in, a, in December, I think. Okay. Or early January. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, they were near in that one there. It would be for Mexico, yes. So then in but he will come, I don't think to, to come. In fact, I'm going to go to the world in a workshop. Okay. Uh, something like that for a week. Mm -hmm. Where you invite so some people. At least a week. And perhaps you can also visit him. I just, I just need to know how, how it works there because uh, I'm interested in how it works there in terms of visits and so on. But it's it's a possibility. But also things will come here. Mm -hmm. There will be this. Um, there will be this. That we have we have more collaborators. Also, Owen from Bloom University in Sweden. Yes, where I was now, and uh, another guy from Mexico. So, mm -hmm. Alfred Weir is also an expert in, in this type of things. Well. Francisco is not a long term expert in emergent drug. Mm -hmm. He's just very interested about it and, right. and made a proposal. Mm -hmm. So that's why this is something new, something exploratory. And John is seeing that uh, we have hands to, to propose mm -hmm. at the moment. Because uh, I think uh, for the first of eight years now, the first of the they started this. Yes, that, that is something that we need to we will have to to have all of the information collected before of course. There's no rubbish bin. No, I was in Sweden and used to not use mask. <laughs> it was it was very good. And now I have to wear it again. But of course, yeah. it's safe. I don't know here, but in Italy, my family told me that the situation is getting worse again. Yeah. So here it's it's also growing, but compared to last year, it's a little different. So this year, at the moment, it's it is still below 2,000 cases per day. One year ago, it was. Reaching 6,000 now. Okay. And yes. it's dying under 10 people per day. Last year it was approaching 100. So, <laughs> so where are you from? Uh, Tento. From Tento, yes. Do you know from like, I visited, I was in a, in Florida. I had a friend that he was doing a, a project there in Florence, in the okay. observatory. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I stayed there two weeks. And then we, we traveled a lot around. But he was from the No, no, he was from the Ah, okay. <laughs> but I, I didn't visit Trent. Uh, okay. But uh, so the Trent is more in the north or? In the north. I think yeah. it's not, right? Yeah. Northern yeah. yeah. North than Padua. Ah, right. Yeah, because uh, I visited pa Padua. Okay. Uh, He's like Venezia. traveled by car from Padua Yes. And I visited that part of the rest. And then uh, also the other side. Um, Isa, and we went also to to the beach in a, so either Rimini, I think it's the other side, and the Arezzo. So, yes, it was a lot better. Now, in the area, I learned the group, but it's really small. And so, my city supervisor told me don't come here because he said the group is dying. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's well, here uh, our group there is uh, is growing at the moment. This depends, but we never know what something that going to be. But at least it's, uh, it has a good perspective to grow. Let's hope. Yeah. The case. I also <laughs> okay, so I think we can.
We start there is still someone missing here. Oh, I think everyone is. Let me see if everyone is here. Right. Okay, so now let's let's move to the to the next uh, next part. So let's talk about uh, Lawrence uh, transformations. Lawrence transformations. Right. So, but for that, let's uh, go again to the uh, beginnings and to the Galileo transformations before coming to Lorentz transformation. Let, let's revisit all this, uh, all this process. So, uh, transformations a la Galileo, let's say, um, time was absolute. So, uh, in classical mechanics, let's say, um, time, let me put another color. Time is absolute in classical mechanics. And then we can define the following transformations. T equals to T prime, uh, X equals to X prime plus VT. And here I'm referring, let me go up. I'm referring to this reference frame here. Let me copy this and paste it there. So that, oops, I did something. No, I didn't. So let me go down again. I will put this a little bit smaller. So we are referring to this reference frame. So X, uh, it equals to x prime plus vt, and then we have y equals to y prime, and z equals to z prime. So these are the the so no, well known Galilei transformations. transformations, right. But there is a problem with this transformation. Do you recall what is the, the problem of these transformations? Anyone online or here? Yes. True, very true. The coordinate sign Exactly. And basically, but what is the consequence? So what I was leading to is um, what is the physical, um, what is the principle that is broken by the Galileo transformations? Exactly. So that's, that's, that's one way of seeing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And what I mean also is like uh, the, the invariance of intervals. So in this way, so with Galilei transformations, we have that ds squared basically is different than some ds prime squared. So this is uh, one of the things that is broken in a, in a, and it has, it's a consequence of what you just said, that the, the, the speed of light, the constancy of speed of light is sort of violated. Uh, and in fact, this can be easily seen uh, because we have like b here we have like ds squared equals to c dt minus dx squared. So I I'm not, uh, I'm only considering one dimension, like 1d. Or just, uh, so all space time coordinates uh, encoded in x, if you prefer. And with Galileo transformations, I will call this Galileo transformations, applying Galilei transformations, what we get is that ds uh, prime squared 
this is going to be equal to c squared dt prime squared minus d x prime plus dt squared and this is different than c squared dt prime squared minus dx prime squared so i think all of us agree here so therefore ds prime squared different than ds squared so i think all of us agree uh, on this so how can we leave this uh, inter interval invariant this is what is answered by the Lorentz transformations but let's let's go there step by step um so in uh, relativistic mechanics uh, time is not absolute as we have been uh, already discussing in the previous hour um, so the transformation of coordinates that leaves this uh, delta s invariant uh, and takes place in the tx plane uh, can be seen as a rotation in the tx uh, tx plane i think this is also familiar um, right. Um, so, what, uh, so when I say uh, when I'm saying rotation, so we are considering a, a rotation the T X plane, and we are talking about something that has a metric that is not Euclidean. So, um, rotations, rotations in the tx plane we are considering rotations the tx plane um, basically uh, described or um, given by or in a uh, uh, text, uh, in a space time whose metric is not Euclidean it's not Euclidean so we have in fact g mu nu equal you know by i plus minus plus 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 is pseudo Euclidean. This said to be pseudo uh, Euclidean, and this means that rotations. This means hyperbolic rotations. If the space was Euclidean, so if you had like plus 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 plus, we could simply had standard rotations. But in this type of space. And for those working in gravity, this is very familiar. We are talking about a pseudo Euclidean metric, and the rotations are hyperbolic. This means that you can define so your coordinates. So x is equal to x prime uh, co cosine hyperbolic of a certain angle theta plus c t prime sine hyperbolic theta and ct here i'm, I'm still using c's <laughs> equal to x prime sine hyperbolic theta plus ct prime cosine hyperbolic theta so you can see this in any any textbook of uh, um, complex analysis or uh, so when you talk about rotations in this um, the Euclidean uh, space time. Right. Um, so now let's verify uh, what happens uh, to these transformations um, um, when we apply this, uh, this type of rotation. So we can then write our ds delta s squared. Let's write the delta s squared now, which is equal to c squared t squared minus x squared and this is in general this here is in general okay. 
and this is equal to now let's apply the, the transformation so it's simply uh, plugging in uh, what uh, we have uh, what we have above basically plugging in this bit here in here actually shouldn't we add delta x and delta t in the um yes we can uh, yes because of this uh, um it's yes it's we we can uh, we cannot i didn't have it here i'm just trying now to remember why why it's fine to do uh this way but i think yeah because you can uh, this is how you define the transformations but you can write, put deltas everywhere pretty much exactly so you can put deltas everywhere if you prefer so Following the suggestion of your colleague, oops, not this. You can put delta here because this is all linear. T delta t, and now delta here, delta here, and then here we can put squared delta t squared. So c, c. Let's put here. Let's try to. Oops. C squared. Mm -hmm. I think I, I didn't put delta just to save time. I think that was that was it. C not the time. Uh, squared like this, mine. So and now here we have to square it. Minus. And now we can write delta x squared minus this bit here okay here squared i think squared up there as well so and this is going to be equal to now we we just expand this uh and this is easy to show that we have something like cosine hyperbolic theta squared minus sine hyperbolic squared theta and now c squared delta t squared delta t prime squared uh, minus delta x prime squared and this is equal you know what is this in hyperbolic so are you aware of this yeah. exactly so this is one so uh, this is equal to simply this c squared delta t prime squared minus delta x prime squared which is equal to delta s prime squared so now we have shown that in a with hyperbolic rotations we do indeed have delta s squared equals to delta s prime squared so now how do we go from here to Lorentz transformation and let me tell you that uh, I'm doing this here because I I much rather prefer to understand from the this uh, geometrical approach where Lorentz transformations are coming from instead of just putting them here um, as uh, God given things. So these are the Lorentz transformations. Let's move on. Now I think it's uh, nice to recall these things uh, to look at these things because this is really um, behind uh, everything else essentially um okay now what what are we doing here uh we are uh, talking about when we look to this reference frame here and i will copy it again let me put here so here we are talking about a motion a motion of the origin of O prime in O, which means that X or delta X prime delta X prime equal to zero. 
Right. So, given this, given this, we have that we can go up here, we can go up here and, and define that our coordinate transformations are then delta x is going to be equal to c delta t prime sine hyperbolic theta and our c dt c delta t equal to um, you know, exactly c delta t squared c delta t sorry delta t prime cosine hyperbolic theta right now if we do now um this means that delta x over c delta t equals to hyperbolic tangent theta and we know that uh, what is this and this is simply so delta x over delta t this is um the velocity Yes, but uh, it's uh, but that's the point. So this is v over c, right? So this is v over c, uh, and this is a very well known parameter. In fact, let me write here equals to uh, so delta x delta t equal to v over c and this is defined typically as beta so this is the beta parameter in a uh, in special relativity guys you give me a minute because i have something in my eye that i need to quickly just try to fix it i have a contact lens sorry for this give me just one minute because it's really unbearable now Okay. I think I recovered now. Okay, so so we have now achieved this uh, the well-known uh, beta parameter just from this hyper, uh, hyperbolic uh, geometry. And, um, and now we, this means that we can uh, rewrite, uh, we can essentially uh, rewrite the things in the following, in the following manner. So if, if we have this, that tan, tan hyperbolic tangent of theta equal to uh, beta, this is uh, equivalent of saying that sine hyperbolic sine of theta over hyperbolic sine of theta equal to some let's call some gamma beta 
over gamma. Therefore, we can write here that so this is a valid relation, and we can write that then sine hyperbolic theta to gamma theta and cos hyperbolic theta equal to gamma. So of course you know what I'm referring to, but let's see exactly what is this gamma. So um, from, from the identity, so you know that one is equal to cosine, hyperbolic cosine theta squared minus hyperbolic cosine theta squared, this is equal to one, so you can write, so replace this, and one is equal to gamma squared minus gamma squared beta squared. From where you take, you can extract that gamma is equal to one over square root one minus beta squared, right? So this is the gamma parameter uh, that is very familiar to all of you. In fact, um, in the second course, uh, I'm planning to look at this uh, through a group theoretical perspective. I still have to define the exactly uh, what is going to be the group theory part of the course, but this is one of the, the goals, is to look at this from a group theoretical uh, perspective, basically to the Lorentz group. Right, so now we can, we can uh, rewrite things in a more familiar way um, about the Lorentz uh, transformations, what are indeed the Lorentz transformations. That CT, then oops, put another color here, then CT equal to gamma beta X prime plus C CT prime x equal to gamma x prime plus beta c c prime and y equal to y prime z equal to z prime so of course i'm considering this this the motion here uh, along the so to the with the velocity uh, parallel to the uh, x axis so and in fact, when you when you make uh, when you make c oops when you make c going to infinity, uh, then you get you get that gamma tends to one uh, goes oops this is curving the arrow goes to one where Galileo transformations are recovered. Basically, right. So there is a, a better way of uh, writing the Lorentz transformations. Uh, let's write the Lorentz transformations in terms of, in terms of matrices. So here we define, and this is how we are going to, from here onwards, how we are going to use Lorentz transformations. Defining a lambda matrix, mu nu, which is, now it's, we just have to look into these vectors, and for this uh, particular case, so with this, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this uh, uh, velocity of the O, o frame in, in relation to O, uh, aligned in this way, so this is, we, we would like to simplify our lives, unless I tell you, ah, this, this is one of the things. You also have ending exercises uh, that I will assign you uh, as, uh, as we go. And I will also prepare some other exercises for you to solve, to them to prepare for the, the, the exam and so on. Um, right, so we have this, uh, this uh, uh, matrix, and you can just read it from a, from a from these uh, uh, green uh, transformations up there, which is gamma, here we have the gamma beta, and then zero, zero, 
gamma beta, gamma, zero, 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 and then one, one. One, oops, one, zero, zero, one. So this is an orthogonal matrix. So this is an orthogonal matrix. Orthogonal matrix. In fact, this is going to be important in a, uh, when looking in, in a, in a, to, to this in a group theoretical approach. So you know the definition of an orthogonal matrix, right? Or if you don't remember, it's not a problem. I, I will tell you, but let me see if, if you if you know you can risk if you say wrong I, I uh, exactly and you know the difference from orthogonal to unitary unitary means the complex exactly so online anyone what is the difference between orthogonal and unitary matrix nobody wants to speak online <laughs> That's why the unitary matrix you need to take the complex conjugate as well. Exactly, perfect. So this is what was said here, um, and uh, so it's good that uh, most of you at least are aware of that. But that's exactly so. Orthogonal matrix O times O the O transposed its identity unitary. It's not a transpose; is the admission conjugate. Just a question for uh, yes. a more complicated block, for example, one uh, mm -hmm. block in a particular X. How hard is it to derive the, the transformation matrix? Um, that's, so the question here is uh, in a, for a generic uh, uh, direction of the velocity, how hard is to de derive the transformation matrix? Well, it's a bit more, uh, it will be a bit cumbersome, I guess. Um, but uh, it, uh, because we will have more terms here, so the, the matrix will be, filled in uh, many many places because it, the x will be dependent on x prime y prime z prime and uh, so it will be a, a little bit more cumbersome but i, I don't think it's a, a very complicated thing but um that, that's actually that gives me an idea to an exercise <laughs> eventually I, I i need to try before i assign this <laughs> i need to try uh, before i uh, i assign that uh, or if that's really relevant, because we, we have to angle, we angle between the and yes. The but if you have, let's say, if you have two um, two reference frames, two inertial frames with respect to another one, as the when that proof of that a is equal to one that we've shown uh, in the previous hour. So we have if you have one of those cases where you have an angle between the velocities, then yes. You, you need to start considering all those possibilities when you, uh, because you cannot align. You can always align in one of those. That, that's always what one should do. Choose a basis where you one of them and is easy. Can you can always do that. That's why this is pretty much generic in a way. When you have only two one uh, two initial friends, this is generic enough. In a way, you can always rotate things in such a way that you align. But if you have two, then you start having angles between, then you need to uh, take that into account. But that's a, a good question. Those are all good things for exercises and uh, <laughs> things to things to do. That's 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 fun to do. In fact, um, I think I've done that in the past, but I really don't remember how difficult or how easy what is. Uh, I think it was not uh, extremely challenging. I need to recall myself. So, and when you have these uh, transformations, now you, you can uh, Lorentz transform now a coordinate. We will no longer do these uh, transformations as, as here. So we will avoid doing this and we will start doing this instead, like X mu equal to lambda mu nu X prime nu. And of course, I'm also assuming that all of you online and, uh, and here in the room uh, know uh, the uh, Einstein summation convention. So I think there is uh, no need to say what it is. Right. Now, it's also uh, important uh, to, to note that uh, you, we can also write this uh, 
Lorentz transformations in terms of uh, derivatives. It's another typical way, you guys from gravity, you are very familiar uh, with this, I suppose. So you can write this lambda mu nu as dx mu dx prime nu. Um, and um, one can show this, we can uh, just uh, do it for a few, a few examples, like for example, dx zero over dx prime zero. So dx zero is like the CT, x zero is CT. Let me just define here. So x zero, x zero is equal to CT here. So when you do this, you just, you look into this, uh, to this, it's like deriving, it's deriving this, this, this uh, part here with respect to CT. So that is, C, uh, in this case, CT prime, deriving with respect to CT prime. So this is pretty much gamma. You can also write, um, you can also do it, for example, for dx zero, dx prime one. And this is the x. This is the x prime one. So the x zero is this. So now it's deriving with respect to this x prime. And so you see, this is gamma beta. Let me put here on the screen. So here, right, gamma beta, like this gamma and this beta, and so on and so forth. So uh, I will not just write here everything. But uh, this is just to uh, show that there is this way of writing the uh, Lorentz uh, matrix, so the Lorentz transformations in terms of the derivatives of the, the coordinates. Also, another, uh, another important uh, result um, is that the Lorentz transformations preserve the metric. So how, how do we see that? So let's let's consider like this ds2 equals to g mu nu uh, dx mu dx nu. And now let's Lorentz transform. Let's let's uh, bring x mu and x nu to the to the O prime frame. So doing that is equal to g mu nu. And now let's write here the, the, the matrix lambda mu alpha, lambda nu beta. Now be very careful in this in this is here. We need always to take into account index contractions and we should only repeat the indices that are uh, summing. Um, dx prime uh, alpha, dx prime beta, I guess this is, yeah, this is consistent. Right, now, um, what is this then? Now, we, we know that uh, we can... Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Which will cancel the X. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that, uh, but essentially, uh, what, uh, what we want to... to uh, to say here is that uh, so we have this this result yeah and then we have like the ds prime squared which is equal and here i will already write in, with alpha just for ease of uh, the alpha beta dx prime uh, dx prime alpha uh, the x prime alpha, the x prime beta. So, um, sorry, I forgot your name. Mark. Mark. Right, so, uh, what uh, what uh, Mark was saying is what uh, I wanted to say here. <laughs> that uh, the transformation of the um, well, essentially, uh, how uh, how this how the metric transforms uh, in terms of uh, with Lorentz uh, uh, with Lorentz boosts. In this case, Lorentz rotations. So what's happening here is that we know that ds squared equals to dx prime squared. Therefore, we take that, looking into this uh, into these uh, equations here, that g alpha beta is equal to g mu nu 
lambda mu alpha lambda nu beta and this is what mark was saying that we have to do and this is exactly what uh, i wanted to uh, just uh, show here that's basically the metric um uh, the Lorentz transformation preserved the metric so Lorentz transformations transformations preserve the metric there you go so another another important concept is that of uh, uh, proper time I'm not going to deep details of uh, um, basically um, um, consideration, all these relativistic considerations of uh, um, space contraction, time dilatation, and so on. So I'm not going to, to uh, but only discuss this proper time because this is in, important in terms of, uh, of, uh, of particle physics, basically. So, uh, if we start from this, uh, uh, from the, the line element, d s squared, um, in the O prime, uh, in the, the, the O prime frame, in the O prime frame, so this is equal to c d t prime squared, right? But we also know that this delta s here we have that this is equal to c squared and dt squared minus uh, dx squared so this is equal to c squared dt prime squared right now we can just uh we can continue this and say that um, let's take the square root here. Yes, I think that's the best way. So we take the square root here of c squared d t squared minus d x squared. Of this okay, d x squared equal to c d t prime prime yes and we can just put c uh, c d t uh, outside so c d t square root of c um, uh, it's one yes one minus now it's one over c squared dx squared d t squared right so you know what is this <laughs> and this is equal to c d t prime squared right so and from here uh, we take that uh, let me already put the d t prime so let me remove this c's this c's here and saying that dt prime is going to be equal to dt and now this is our beta one minus beta squared let's write this neat away so one one minus uh, beta squared therefore this is our gamma we have that mm, this is not gamma, this is one over gamma. Basically, dt prime equals to dt over gamma. And since uh, gamma is bigger than one, we see uh, that time slows down. So this means that, let me just point this out. So gamma is bigger than one, so then time slows 
down, essentially. In O prime, of course, in O prime, this is. Exactly, exactly. Right, so th this is just uh, this concept is important because in what uh, follows, uh, we will need to take this, uh, we'll use this result. So now this is the last part of uh, relativity, of this special relativity introduction, uh, where we are going to look to the four vectors, uh, the velocity and uh, energy momentum. And the, the questions that we are going to start from here, are, some of them are very familiar to you, and they are going to be useful in, uh, in, um, in various contexts. We are going to talk about relativistic equations, so it's important to start from first principles, introducing things here. So, four vectors. So, velocity, so it's a, in fact, four velocity and four. Uh, energy momentum. So first of all, you guys know uh, what is needed for, uh, for us to say that a certain quantity is a uh, four vector. Right? Precisely, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, it, but in this case, transformer talking about Lorentz transformations, uh, Exactly. So essentially, so a quantity, a mu, oops, a mu equal to a zero, right? It's four vector. It transforms as basically a mu prime equal to lambda mu nu a nu right so uh, now um, we define the four vector velocity so how do we define the four vector velocity Or vector velocity. So we define this in the following way. So a certain u, so u mu equal to the limit when delta s here, yes, delta s goes to zero of delta x mu over delta x uh, delta s i mean uh, delta s and this is uh we just this is defined as um the, when we take this limit this is simply the x mu exactly over the s and this is, we can write this as dx mu, and now we take this, uh, um, we know that the ds, uh, we can write this as c dt prime. This we can write. So this, this is an analogy to the definition of, of the three velocity, but this is a dimensionless quantity here. So, um, now let's look at what happens in the train O. Train O. What happens here? So in the O frame, we have dx mu equal to C dt, and here we will have dr, the r vector. So this is not this is not the proper frame of the, the, the particle, let's say, so it's not at rest. 
therefore, the forward velocity it's going to be equal to dx mu over ds. And we here we just use the above definition here, which is then one over c c dt over dt prime. And here the R the T prime. I already put the one over C outside. Right. So this is one over C, and now we get use the same the, the, the results that we have been deriving. So that's why we we derive this uh, this uh, um, proper time here, this dt prime equals to dt over gamma. So now we are going to make use of this to get the following. So C dt over gamma minus one dt dr over gamma minus one dt. And this is then we can just remove uh, this the first C with this, just not with the second one, of course. Uh, but this is going to be then uh, gamma one, and here it's beta. I can I can even put here a vector because this is uh, as a directional information it's uh, the velocity so it's the vector it's the, the the velocity of the particle let's say in terms of the uh, uh, in comparison to the speed of light of course and what about the O prime frame this is a little bit easier right so dx mu is going to be equal to C D T prime. Right, C D T prime and now zero. So this is the no vector. So U mu is going to be equal to one over C C D T prime dt prime zero which is simply one zero so in the proper reference frame of the particle this is this is it and, and here this is you clearly see this is dimensionless of course we don't doubt that gamma and beta are dimensionless but uh, here uh, we really have no doubts that one is dimensionless. So, um, so this is a dimensionless quantity, and also uh, this also shows that this uh, for vectors. So we have u mu u mu equal to one for any frame, of course. It would be it would be terrible if it would be different. <laughs> this is a Lorentz invariant. This is a Lorentz invariant. Lorentz invariance, essentially. Okay, if you want, if you want to look to momentum now, th this is why I have not removed the C's yet. I will only remove them after this uh, section, because this is a dimensionalized quantity. And now, if you want to talk about velocity, it's more intuitive to start with still keeping the C's around uh, for us to, and if in, in relativistic quantum mechanics. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Okay. It was at Evald. At Evald, I think you are back in. I thank you very much because I'm not seeing the screen. So guys, if you notice that, please <laughs> uh, warn me about uh, what's going on there. Right.
So, and uh, I think I'm not muted now. Okay. Right, so this is a Lorentz invariant. For the energy momentum, now for the energy momentum, energy. For the energy momentum, now let's uh, let's let's uh, use the the, the uh, let's say the, the units the correct units of uh, of uh, momentum. Start off in this case um, of this four momentum. Let's have p mu. I'll write with the lower case letters. P mu equal to something times u mu. So u mu is dimensionless. So we really we need to put here some uh, dimensions to make it uh, having dimensions uh, of momentum. So one of the things uh, you, we know from classical mechanics is the mass times velocity. So here it's simply mass and c. And c makes it, that's why it's important to keep the c's up until now. So c makes it makes it having it it's p mu makes p mu having uh, dimensions of momentum so are you, are you guys following i think so far it's not uh, a big novelty so I think it's possible to follow, yes. So um, now we, we can just contract this P mu, P mu, and this is going to be what M, M C squared U mu, U mu, and as it was shown above here, we have this is simply equal to M squared c squared right um right now uh right i lost my eyes here but also we know that p mu p mu this is equal to p naught minus p squared And P naught, so this one here, has dimensions of energy over velocity. Ah, I forgot the square here. So we can rewrite this in the following way. P mu, P mu equal to energy squared over C squared minus P squared. And this is equal to M squared C squared. We can solve this or equate this, and yet that E squared is going to be equal to, so it's basically multiplying everything by, uh, by C uh, squared. So it's going to be equal to M squared C to the fourth plus P squared C squared. Therefore, this is one of the well-known results that energy equal to the square root of m squared c to the fourth plus uh, p, p squared c squared. Now, I'm defining already like p squared equals to p squared, which is equal to p dot p so just to not going wandering around with it so this is a scalar so it's it's okay 
Right. So uh, also for 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 those for you that you are working in neutrinos and so on, I think you see these <laughs> equations a lot. Um, right now, for the particle at rest, a particle at rest that is t equals zero, then you know the well known equation e equals to m c squared. So, and this has profound, uh, uh, profound uh, um, implications uh, for particle physics. So, observer, observer in O prime. Essentially, we can read this equation from left to right or right to left, and this is the principle of uh, uh, of uh, what happens at colliders. So, if we look from left to right, we are giving energy to produce matter, basically. Uh, if we look from right to left, uh, we are uh, basically uh, annihilating matter and producing energy. So this is, this is the, the two ways of uh, looking uh, to this equation. This is the principle behind the, the functioning of the energy. How can we, from protons, generate much, much heavier particles? OK. Go to E equal to MC squared and read it from left to right. Put the protons, accelerate them to enormous energies, and all that energy will be uh, converted into uh, new particles. It will materialize new particles. Um, and the, uh, in cosmic rays and so on, this is also very important because the cosmic rays are coming from uh, from the, the like uh, the outer from the universe, from very energetic processes happening out there, and they reach our atmosphere. They collide with uh, with uh, with uh, with the constituents of our atmosphere, and they generate these cascades of. Uh, uh, what is the experiment you are working on, by the way? Uh, so movement But what uh, what is the experiment? Um, yeah, OG. Uh, OG, exactly. So this is exactly the 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 what <laughs> what I was learning to. So all the, all this OG experiment is indeed looking to these sort of things. Also looking from uh, left to right in this situation. <laughs> Basically, there is one difference. There is actually one big difference between what happens with cosmic rays, for example, and what happens with accelerators. Because in accelerators we can exactly use this e equals to mc squared and align so say we we send the protons head to head uh, and we know that in the transverse so in the transverse plane the momentum is zero and then we reconstruct uh, all the decay the, the products basically uh, summing all their momenta and the energy and saying okay this has to be uh, summed up to zero at the end if it's not it means that there is something missing there are neutrinos or there is dark matter or there, there is something else in cosmic rays, it's a lot more challenging because we don't control the environment. You know nothing. So we know, we know very little. Exactly. You, want, you, exactly, you know very little. You, you only know the final products and the energy that reached uh, the, your detector. And not really what kind of particles Exactly, exactly. You don't know which kind of particles were, uh, it collided to and so on. So it's a lot more challenging. It's very interesting, I think, but it's a lot more challenging in terms of controlling the environment. Yeah, the, the, that's the thing. You have access to much higher energies, but you. In, so for those online that don't hear the discussion here, at least from the audience, uh, what's happening is that uh, we are discussing the, the interplay between uh, or the difference between the collider physics and the cosmic ray physics, which are two areas of particle physics. And in fact, so in collider physics, in colliders, we control the environment. We know very well what are the initial products, and we know very well to reconstruct the final products. We know to identify missing energy. We know what's happening there. But we have technological limitations that does not allow us to go to very high energies. On the cosmic ray side, it's the opposite. Uh, we have at our disposal really, really, really very high energies, which if a collider could reach there, we could do really groundbreaking physics. 
But the problem is that we do not only control, we don't control the environment. We don't know the angles of the particles in the beginning, we know how they, how are they colliding, what's happening exactly there. We only know what reaches the Earth, the temperature at Earth. And we can infer a few things from there. But if we knew the exact conditions of the collisions in the high atmosphere, we could possibly have access to new physics in a much better way than particle colliders. Yes, yes, that, that, that is the AMS experiment and this sort of thing. And Fermilat as well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But anyway, this is just to, to make the context here that uh, uh, this equation, this famous equation is really, really very important in the, in the context of the particle physics. Of course, the generic one is, is, is this one that I'm going now to highlight in, uh, in red. This is the, the, say, the exact one. We also know that for photons, the photons, so they don't have mass. So this is simply a C. See, this is their, uh, this is their, uh, their energy, the energy of photons uh, in both frames, basically. Photons is a bit weird because since we can't define the form velocity. We make up a form momentum for photons in order, almost in order to give that equation. Or that. Sorry, what was your question at the end of your reasoning, your initial reasoning? I understood it. It seems to me that it's a bit artificial to define a form momentum for the photon because mm -hmm. the photon has no uh, form velocity. You can't find form <clears> velocity <throat> for the photon. So we kind of make up a uh, uh, momentum squared equal zero. So the thing is, what you have, what you have here, uh, exactly. That's why this is the same in both frames. Uh, I understand what you what you mean. Yeah, it's a little, at least counterintuitive, at least. Uh, but this is like a, this has dimensions of energy. Yeah. This c times v. This has this, is, this. Everyone agrees that this is an energy, and this follows if if you, for massless particles this holds. That's clear. Now, in terms of uh, well, the four momentum, the four momentum is simply like uh, um, zero, uh, zero p. And the thing is, but the consequence of this is that uh, you cannot put photons at rest. Yes, there's no more strain. You cannot, you cannot go to the to the proper, let's say, to the frame of the photon and say, okay, now I'm going to put you in a bottle. Time. Exactly. And that's why, for example, for massless particles, the momentum derives from multiplying the, the mass with their velocity. Yes, yes, and yes, yes, yes. That's a good point. That's a good point, indeed. Indeed, that's true. That's true. It's, um, but, uh, um, yeah, but that, that's uh, that's the way this is. Uh, this is. Um... Well, the, the the thing is that uh, typically. Precisely, but this is the way I, I look into it more. It's uh, like um, I think of the energy more as uh, the photons more as uh, energy, not not uh, their momentum. Let's say more their energy. Um, and, and the energy, so it's simply this C, CP in, uh, in all primes. This is something that is easy to understand and to accept. Uh, of course, about their, their um, what you were saying, that defining the four momentum for a particle that does not have a mass, and so on. Yes, that's, uh, that's a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, this you were basically talking about this, this part here. Of course, this for a photon is, uh, but you first do this in general for particles with a mass, and then you take the limit, let's say, when the mass goes to zero. Right. That, that's, that's, and, and in that sense, it works. In that, in that sense, of course, if you start with the particular case, this is the same as when if you take, uh, if you go to your high school and look at limits, there are limits that you go and, uh, and they are indefinite, like zero over zero or something like that. If you simply replace by the values of the, the limits, but when you take these rules uh, to 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 
to resolve the indetermination, you find out that the limit is a, a, a finite value. This is this is uh, in a way this is the way how I remember to have the same problems, not problems, but the same okay. sort of the same sort of okay. the same sort of thinking as you are having now about the definition of the form of to a photon. Uh, but in fact, in the limit, this is almost always true for photons. Yes, but and I can we, we take the definition for the photon to be that one. Yes. But I can tell you something. This is completely. You have to agree with the, the problem in relation to my photon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, so. Sometimes photons just define the value of the photon. You can take away. It's not unnecessary. You don't have to have a tendency to the mass. No, of course. Of course. In that sense, I can think of the mass at all. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Totally, totally. That's uh, that's how. And actually, that if you go to the beginnings of quantum mechanics, and that's how uh, things were initially defined. Exactly. And anyway, so just to finalize this, and this uh, uh, we will end our uh, relativity part here. Uh, we can further expand this uh, uh, this uh, this energy, so we can. Right in other color, so E. You can put outside the M uh, uh, M M uh, C squared. M C squared. This is also a known result, uh, and then here you have one plus T squared over M squared C to the fourth. Uh, c squared because there is a c squared on, on the numerator c squared and now you can just tailor expand this thing um and here it's for small velocities this is equal for now small velocities small velocities i think you may remember this and now this is one plus one half P squared over M squared C squared plus terms that are dominated by P for over M to the four. Like this, so do you guys recognize um, Ah, and, and of course, now let me just uh, write it. So this is going to be equal to, or this implies that E into MC squared plus one half T squared over M. Um, Exactly. And uh, yeah, I, I, like, I prefer to write this this way. Exactly. This is more. It's the same thing, but it's more familiar, yeah. like this. It's just <laughs> I wanted to write it this way, but I was solving this life, and uh, and this is uh, more. Um, so you know what it is right so this is the rest energy and what it is what is this exactly and then here the, the dots are relativistic corrections And overall, you can define. And now this is where I will start dropping C's. <laughs> One last time with C's, we have like uh, overall you can summarize this uh, this uh, momentum uh, this uh, momentus momenta as follows. So P mu equals to gamma m c one beta.
T prime mu. So now in the in the proper frame equals to M C one zero. So the relativistic expressions for the, the energy you 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 take from uh, uh, from here once again. So basically, you have like this is um, e. Oops. So e equal to gamma m c in the reference frame O, and in O prime you have e equals to m c squared. So um, basically, what um, uh, one, just give me one second. Uh, of course, <laughs> I, I, I was uh, missing a squared here. We yes. will define uh, a relativistic mass. Exactly, exactly. We just define. <laughs> yeah, I'm also not very fan of that. <laughs> uh, and for the momentum, it's uh, the same, uh, same story. <laughs> For the momentum, you have like this gamma m v and p prime equals to zero. But overall, or to to finalize now, uh, from now on. We will drop C. We'll put C equal to one. So these are natural units. I heard someone at some point saying, I don't understand why C equals to one when there is a, a really, uh, a really uh, definite value uh, so this this is not understanding what's being talked about, and I I think that all of you here understand what uh, we meant when we this is a little bit abuse of writing saying c equals to one, uh, but what we are doing exactly, and we are basically dividing everything by by it, and we are writing it in terms of of c's. So c is intrinsically there. We just don't write it because we are dividing the result. Uh, by C essentially, and the same with the Planck constant H and uh, even the electric charge. Mm -hmm. Exactly, all of that. And with this, we end up with so the, the, the equations that result from the, so all of this today is to result in this E equal to M. This is the equation that goes from left to right or right to left, and we have various consequences, and E in general square root of m squared plus p squared. Right, and this, uh, this equation here, this uh, second one will be very important in the next, for next lecture because we will derive the Klein-Gordon equation uh, from uh, here. But first we will go to the Maxwell theory. But I think we are approaching as it's 12 already. So um, at least I'm getting a little bit exhausted <laughs> at this time. I guess you, you may also be tired. Um, so in the next lecture, we are going to, to relativistic equations and relativistic quantum mechanics. And we are going to cover all of that. And hopefully already start with, uh, with Lagrangian formulation. Uh, so as I told you, and also for those online, uh, I will, I can stop recording, but I will put this lecture online. Um, I just need to work out if there is any restriction, any, any limitation of putting this in, a, in our website or not. Uh, pause, stop recording.